We've already pulled apart the first Jurassic Park, and, weirdly enough, you all seem to enjoy me shattering the magic just a little bit. So, think of this as a canon event. Everyone at some point has to find out that Spielberg's dinosaurs aren't exactly textbook accurate, and I'm here just doing a public service. So why just stop at one? Today, we're heading to Site B, The Lost World's Jurassic Park, the 1997 sequel that brought us raptors in tall grass, a T-Rex in San Diego, and some of the wildest set pieces in the entire franchise. And while we won't rehash the same old raptor sized debate or frog DNA shenanigans, we've already been there, this film has plenty of its own prehistoric nonsense worth picking apart. So, the film opens with a pack of Compsognathus swarming a young girl on a beach. They move like coordinated piranhas, taking down prey many times their size, although not in this particular scene. In reality, however, Compsognathus was chicken sized and very lightly built. There's no fossil evidence of venom or paralytic bites, and while they may have scavenged in groups, coordinated hunting like this is speculation at best. The tiny death swarm is more of a movie monster than paleontology. Side note, if you're wondering why I brought up venom and paralytic bites, it's because in Michael Crichton's novel, the combis are said to have a neurotoxic venom. In the movie, while it's not explicitly stated or mentioned, the fact that Dieter becomes increasingly disorientated from small bites across his body when he's attacked when he goes to relieve himself, it heavily implies that neurotoxic venom may actually be present in the movie too. But maybe I'm just reading into the scene a little bit too much here with knowledge from the books. I don't know, let me know what you think in the comments. Side side note, before someone comments, I know that in the book the species Crichton uses is Procomsognathus, but Spielberg uses the slightly smaller Compsognathus, which is a different genus entirely. Burke, in the movie, wrongly identifies them as Compsognathus triassicus. Sognathus triassicus which is just a combination of Procomsognathus triassicus and Compsognathus longipes, further adding fuel to the Burke is an idiot and had no idea what he was chatting fire. Next up, we have Isla Sauna's impossible ecosystem. Site B is shown to be teeming with predators and prey, all crammed into one island and somehow thriving. Realistically, large carnivores like Tyrannosaurus would need vast territories. A single adult could require hundreds of square kilometers to find enough food. On Sauna, apex predators seem to live shoulder to shoulder without annihilating the herbivore populations and themselves. It makes for constant dinosaur encounters, but the ecology would collapse within months. Admittedly, this is a minor nitpick, uh, as we know that Jurassic Park 3 expands on this, but we'll get to that one when we look at that movie under the microscope. The first dinosaur that we properly see with our main cast of characters on the island is Stegosaurus. This is when Sarah Harding gets a little bit too close to a juvenile. Her camera malfunctions and the herd immediately charge in, swinging Thagomizers left and right. If you want to know more about Thagomizers, then check the pinned comments. The real Stegosaurus was big, 6-9 meters long, but not quite the hulking giants that we see in the film. The defensive tail strikes are plausible, fossil evidence shows Stegosaurus could injure or even kill predators such as Allosaurus, but complex herd defense of an older juvenile is speculative at best. Parental care in Stegosaurus also hasn't been proven, and nothing suggests that they would coordinate together to take down an aggressor. I'm not chalking this up to complete inaccuracy, however. That is reserved for the morphology of the juvenile Stego itself. It's just not quite right. The skull shape is completely off what we'd expect to see. Also, due to the alignment and structure of Stegosaurus's pelvis, the downward strike that lands into the log that Sarah is hiding in would not be possible. Next up, we have the headbutting myth. During the roundup scene, Pachycephalosaurus slams into a jeep with its domed head. While their skulls were thick, many paleontologists actually think that they weren't built for head-to-head -head high speed ramming. They may have engaged in flank butting or slow shoving contests instead. The jeep smashing behaviour was pure cinematic exaggeration, and likely would have injured the animal. There is, however, still some debate about this. The fact that the skulls were 9 inches thick does throw some evidence into the corner of yet they headbutted each other forcefully, but it's likely that it would have been a last resort tactic. Also, the idiot Burke yaps on about reinforced neck and spine to absorb the impact, but there is little to no evidence of this. More fuel to that fire. Next up, the baby T-Rex. The juvenile Rex in the film looks like a scaled down adult. Same proportions, just smaller. In reality, young T-Rex would have had longer legs, slimmer bodies, and proportionally smaller heads. They were built for speed and not power, and their hunting style would have been completely different from adults. It's thought that juvenile rexes actually filled an entirely separate ecological niche before they grew into adulthood. The movie's baby also gets hand-fed and heavily supported by its parents, suggesting strong parental care. Possible in some dinosaurs, 
but completely unproven in Tyrannosaurs. After the baby's leg is set, the adult Rexes find the trailer almost instantly, supposedly by following the smell of the baby's blood. While predators can track scents, and we do actually believe that Tyrannosaurus had phenomenal sense of smell, the speed and precision here is wildly exaggerated. Even modern scent specialists like wolves rely on favourable winds and fresh trails. Two multi-ton Rexes navigating dense jungle directly to one small trailer in minutes, it's pushing it. Speaking of T-Rex, the finale of the movie hinges on moving a live adult Rex from Isla Sauna to San Diego. In reality, sedating and transporting a 9-ton apex predator across an open ocean would be a veterinary nightmare. Prolonged sedation risks respiratory failure, overheating or even death. And the cramped cargo hold shown in the movie? A stressed animal that size could easily injure itself or destroy the enclosure long before ever making it to port. It is addressed somewhat in the movie. Sarah is annoyed at the lack of due diligence with regards to dosage administered. It's how her and Ian know what the Rex will do next, seek water and food. Side effects to the high dosages. That leads nicely onto the San Diego Rampage. Once loose in the city, the Rex wanders around roaring, tipping cars and sampling pedestrians. A real predator suddenly dropped into an unfamiliar environment would likely panic, hide or focus solely on finding food. Indiscriminate destruction wastes energy, something apex predators avoid unless they're threatened or defending territory. This is where the Lost World lent fully into movie monster in the city aspect. Great entertainment, but not hugely accurate animal behaviour on display. Lastly, I want to talk about the unrealistic speeds. The Rex and other large dinosaurs are shown sprinting at vehicle chase speeds. Must go faster. Biomechanical studies suggest that T-Rex probably topped out at around 20 to 25 kilometers per hour, which is 12 to 15 miles per hour. Any faster and the stress on its bones could risk catastrophic injury. Smaller predators could move quicker, but the high-speed chases here are more fast and furious than facts and fossils. The Lost World of Jurassic Park cranked up the action, introduced new species and took the dinosaurs off the island for the first time, but it also left the real science in the dust. We've skipped the repeat offenders from the first film, but even without them, they're still more than enough to make paleontologists wince. But honestly, that's the fun part, because every time Hollywood takes liberties, it gives us the perfect excuse to talk about it and wonder what these amazing animals were actually like. Did I miss anything? Let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe so you can catch my analysis of the next Jurassic Park franchise entry. But until then, stay curious.